Zach is back. It's the Zach Gelb Show on Fox Sports 920, The Jersey. All right, welcome back in. Time of the Princeton Orthopedic Associate Studios is 415. Ever since the news broke yesterday that the Sixers gave their own Noel away for nothing, we have not been happy and we've been discussing it. So let's get the Mavericks perspective from it as they had some highway robbery in this deal. And the Mavs TV play-by-play man is going to join us right now, and that is Mark Followell on the Zach Gelb Show. Mark, appreciate the time, and how are you? I'm good. I uh, I loved uh, your setup for our interview. This uh, <laughs> will certainly be interesting to hear your guys' perspective as much as it is for, for you all to hear mine. Well, we don't like it. And today, Brian Colangelo did speak, and he talked about how they probably weren't going to pay Nerlens Noel, and they didn't want to give him that deal if there was another team that was going to match it because he's a restricted free agency, blah, 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 blah. And then he started to sell me on Justin Anderson. And I've watched Justin Anderson's career, and I've talked to people around the league, and he hasn't been that good. You've seen him more than we have. Just tell me what type of player we're getting in Justin Anderson. Well, you're getting somebody who I do think has a future. Uh, You know, the thing with Justin is that, number one, and and this, of course, is why he does have a future, is we're talking about a fantastic athlete, an NBA body, a lot of bounce, the ability to do some pretty unique things in terms of chase-down blocks, rebounding the ball for a wing player, uh, elevating and being able to finish around the rim, run the floor, be active, play with energy, do all those sorts of things. So he does have all of that. You know, the thing for Justin is that uh, other than his junior and final year at Virginia, he's never been able to demonstrate a consistent outside shot. And he had his ups and downs in terms of trying to get into Rick Carlisle's rotation this year. And, and, and let me backtrack a little. You know, last year as a rookie, he didn't play much. At the end of the season, though, the Mavs went on a really good run. Uh, There were a lot of injuries. Justin was forced into a starting small forward role, and I thought really thrived as a guy who could play off Dirk, who was still averaging 20 points a game at the time, Uh, a red-hot J.J. Barea, who was starting at point guard at the time, and as a matter of fact, late last year, won Western Conference Player of the Week. I thought that he played really well off them. This year, Justin came in early in the season and had a rotation spot, but he had a rotation spot at a time that the Mavs were hammered by injuries, were off to a terrible start, and he was not playing off really good players like a red-hot J.J. Barea or Dirk last year averaging 20 points a game like he was late in the season. And I thought that that, that put him in a tough spot, and he struggled. Uh, I, I think a year and a half into his career, I still see him as a playoff of other people guy because of his off-the-ball movement and athleticism and cutting and those sorts of things rather than a player who has reached a stage in his career where other people can play off him. There's nothing wrong with that, by the way. Uh, you know, There's still some things he's got to put together in his game, but I think that there's a lot of talent there. It's just, it's just all got to come together. No offense to Justin Anderson, and I hope he does work in Philadelphia, but Brian Colangelo has been on the record that, hey, we're not just going to give away a player. We're going to have to try to get something or someone of equal value back. I don't see the equal value when you compare him to an Erlens Noel, and I know they're different players. I'd have to feel mm-hmm. that the feel in Dallas right now is that they just robbed the Sixers, right? Would you think that's fair to say? Uh, I think that would be relatively fair to say. Yes, I think that most people around Dallas, not not universally, uh, I, I have heard some from some fans who don't agree with that sentiment. But by and large part, fan sentiment and media sentiment is that the Mavs were the clear winner in the trade. No question about that. And I would have to imagine that the Mavs fan is also probably thinking, I know you only saw him for uh, two different stints, but when they look at New Orleans, the wall, I'm probably – have to think that they're thinking that this is going to be the next Tyson Chandler just at a younger age, right? That's exactly the comparison that Donnie Nelson, the Mavericks general manager, made in his press conference in Dallas this morning. And I didn't get the chance to hear or see it because we're in Minnesota preparing for a game with the Timberwolves tonight. But, of course, uh, as you know, this stuff makes its way online and gets onto Twitter and things like that. And so, yes, that's that's precisely the comparison that Donnie made earlier today, uh, you know, and, and the reason being, of course, is that Nerlens, as you know, is a dynamic threat as a role man of the pick and roll, like Tyson Chandler was, uh, you know, an elite lob threat and an elite rim protector. And so he, he checks off a lot of the boxes in terms of the potential that he has to do things at an elite level and has demonstrated he can do that some. 
obviously not to the level uh, in terms of team success and, and length of career that Tyson Chandler has. Uh, but, yeah, he checks off a lot of the boxes that Chandler would check off over his illustrious career. And I'm curious to see what you guys do with him. And I know that he could walk at the end of the year, and probably the plan is to keep Nerlens Noel. As we're talking to Mark Folliwell, the play-by-play man on the television for the Dallas Mavericks. Uh, but with Noel, I know he's not going to play tonight. He's going to make his debut tomorrow against the Pelicans. What are the plans in Dallas for Nerlens Noel? Well, I think ultimately, I mean, number one, you're right that, of course, they wouldn't have made this sort of trade without the idea of being able to re-sign him. The Mavs desperately need young athletic talent, and certainly, as you know, New Orleans Noel fits that bill. Um, the Mavs are going into a transition time right now, uh, you know, and that's that's really started this year with going towards a more youth movement on the team. So especially given given their desire for that, Noel's talent, how he can fit into Rick's system, Rick Carlisle, speaking of the Mavs head coach, uh, the, the relationship with the agent, Dan Fagan, there is a positive relationship there with Mark Cuban and Dan Fagan. So I would be very, very surprised if New Orleans Noel doesn't sign a contract to stay with the Mavs, be it through matching an offer sheet, but I don't think it'll ever get to that stage. I think they'll work something out in the off season. The immediate plan, uh, you know, he'll play tomorrow night. I don't know what Rick plans on doing in terms of, you know, maybe just to get him acclimated for a few games while he learns the system. Uh, he might come off the bench. I don't know that for certain. I mean, clearly, ultimately here, uh, this is somebody who has to be the Mavs starting center. I think you've got to give him that opportunity. I certainly understand bringing him off the bench for a while, for a few games while you get him acclimated, and it will cause a, posi- a position change, that is, or presumably – I mean, in my opinion on this, I think this is going to lead to, for some portion of the remainder of the season, Dirk Nowitzki sliding from five back to four. Dirk's been playing five predominantly most of the year. Harrison Barnes moves from power forward down to small forward. Matthews, Wesley Matthews, moves from small forward back down to shooting guard. Yogi Ferrell's the Mavs starting point guard right now. Somebody else that that you guys are familiar with after some time with the Long Island Nets and the D-League and, of course, with Brooklyn for 10 games this year. Uh, You know, I think that would be what you would think the, the optimal Mavs starting lineup would be for, for some stretch at the tail end of the season. Mark, let's just compare PR departments here real quickly and also compare the organizations. This is how they tried to spin the trade to us yesterday. Here was the headline. Philadelphia 76ers acquire first-round pick Justin Anderson and Andrew Bogut from Dallas. I thought it was laughable that they – put in that first round pick because we know that it's top 18 protected. How did they make that headline in Dallas yesterday? Just wondering. Uh, I would have to scroll back through my email. I don't, uh, I don't recall anything though that, that stood out about it, but I think clearly the, the headline was about acquiring Noel. Um, you know, I, 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 I can't answer your question specifically because I don't have my email open right now. I'm trying to get to it as fast as I can while we're talking, but I don't remember anything that stood out or anything that was weird or spin or, uh, you know, anything anything along those lines. I'm, uh, let's see here. Da, 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 da. You got sorry, it, because just on our end, in our end, it's very comical that they tried to spin it to us, and today they, they didn't double down on it. They backtracked on that, but to try to sell the first-round pick, we, we know the Mavs, they're going to be within the 18, uh, first 18 spots of the lottery. Sure, sure. I mean, the Mavs would basically have to to get that pick out of the top 18 and to 19 or later in the first round. I mean, it would take, let's be honest, it would take virtually, and I'm serious about this, I mean, it would it would almost take the Mavs winning every game for the remainder of the year for, for something like that to happen. So so clearly, uh, you know, there's 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 not, you know, as, as much as I would like to see a great season for the remainder of the Mavs, there's not much likelihood of that happening. I'm just going back and looking at my email, by the way. An email just said that the, the headline to it was Mavericks acquired Nerlens Noel from 76ers. Uh, they announced today they acquired Nerlens Noel in exchange for Isaiah, uh, and I'm sorry, in exchange for Justin Anderson, center Andrew Bogan, and a 2017 protected first round pick. Okay. That's how it was, Fair that's how it was positioned today. Mark, follow yeah. with us right now on the Zach Gelb show. Nationally, just because you're obviously not in Philadelphia, how do you perceive what the Sixers are doing right now? Well, I mean, the perception to me, of course, is that they spent way too much time in terms of kicking the can down the road and drafting players who wouldn't be here. Although the the Shards thing clearly seems like it's a positive thing, and Embiid clearly seems like this is going to be a positive, but, but the perception is 
that it was torn down too far. I certainly understand the desire to want to get lottery picks, and it's understandable there are times in this league when you have to, to, to strip it down pretty far and you don't want to have a good record or a mediocre record because you want to be in a position to get the best draft pick you possibly can. Uh, for a while, I felt like, though, that that was just like we're, we're, we're going to be so bad and we're going to not have any sort of veteran leadership to, to provide uh, you know, somebody here who's been through the wars, who understand what it takes just to be a good professional, I mean, let alone getting into the winning aspect of things, just what it takes to be a good professional. So, so my perception is certainly they're doing something that you have to do in this league from time to time to be able to acquire high-level talent. But, but my thought process has always been that they went too far that direction and completely, completely moving away from the concept of having any veterans to help uh, the transition process to the league for players coming out of, uh, you know, a year of college or two years of college. You know how tough it is to win in this league, and right now there's only a few teams that have a chance, and some people think it's only two teams that have a chance to win it all this year with the Cavaliers and the Warriors. That's why I'm fine now, and I've changed over the years on this tanking philosophy, but I'm fine with it. Do you possibly see, and I know the league fears this, and that's why they tried to run Sam Hinkie out of town, but do you possibly fear that maybe more teams will start tanking, and do you think that would be a smart approach? Well, I think there's times that it's smart. Uh, you know, I haven't looked in, in terms of, you know, whose who's roster makeup right now is poised for we've done all we can do with this, which was kind of the thought process for the 76ers is that, uh, you know, they had reached a place where, they were an eight seed. They did get fortunate that Derrick Rose got hurt in, in 2012, and they were able to pull off an upset. But basically, I think that they had viewed themselves, especially whenever the Bynum trade completely blew up, that, that that roster had gone as far as it was going to go, and it was time to head into a different direction. There's always going to be teams and organizations who realize that they're in a dead-end place, and the only way to get out of the dead end is to drop down and be in a position where you're going to accumulate high-level talent very early in the draft with high picks. So, you know, that thing is never going to go away. Do I feel like that we're going to see a surge in it? The only reason I think that you would make that argument is the CBA is trending into a direction with these Supermax extensions and things like that where we're certainly – it's going to be more – more and more unlikely that great players are going to change teams in free agency. The money advantage is going to be so prohibitive in favor of the team that drafts you and brings you along that that's going to be the best way to to be able to secure the kind of talent that you need to win at the highest levels in this league. So, so that, to me, will be what in the future is going to promote more of it if, in fact, we see an uptick in that. But there's always going to be teams who have to do it because, as we know, um, you know, that's getting getting a high draft pick is is one method in terms of acquiring the kind of talent that you need to win at a high level. So that's never going to go away completely, of course. And Mark, I know you're focused on the game tonight, but lastly, tomorrow you're going to be able to see the Pelicans. Uh, that's a team that now has Anthony Davis and Boogie Cousins. How do you view the Pelicans right now? I know they probably got to add a few pieces in that backcourt, but that front court looks definitely promising. Well, it's a, it's a great trade for New Orleans, but they still have to figure it out, and they don't have a whole lot of time to do it. Uh, they're lucky in that it's a very, very compact race between a handful of teams that are separated by three games. I think there's six teams between eight and 13 in the Western Conference that are separated by three games that are battling for that last playoff spot. And for some organizations, like in Minnesota, who's part of that mix, who the Mavs played tonight, I mean, it would be great, even if it does mean your first-round fodder for Golden State to get into the playoffs would be a great thing. And I think for New Orleans it would be a great thing. Uh, they were first-round fodder for Golden State two years ago, and then we're out of the mix last year, and to get back into it, that would be very good. Uh, it's a great trade, but that doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to hit the ground running in terms of getting those two players together on the same page and working out the chemistry, uh, whereas you're competing with, for example, Denver, who I think is uh, a very nice young team who has some intriguing pieces and, and is the team sitting at eight right now. And the other thing that New Orleans doesn't have is they're, they're just woefully thin whenever you get past Anthony Davis and DeMarcus Cousins. So it's a good trade. It's, it's a chance to put another great player alongside Anthony Davis, which they've been trying to do for years now, as we know. Um, does it mean they're going to make the playoffs this year? Like I think a lot of people view that as, oh, New Orleans is going to be the eighth seed in the West now. And I think that is by far from certain because you know they, they've got to hit the ground running and figure out how to make that work in a really short period of time. And 
there's certainly no guarantees that they can do that, especially given the lack of talent that they have on their roster after you get past the top two players. Mark, just one more thing because it just popped up in my head. I absolutely love your owner in Mark Cuban, and I find his role in Shark Tank to just be awesome. What do they say in the organization? What do the players say about Cuban when they see him on Shark Tank? Do they watch it? You know, that is, that's interesting you ask me that. Uh, I, I believe that, that players around the league have a very positive view of Mark because of spending money and passion for the NBA and passion for his team and his players. I really don't get much in the way of feedback from players around the league or others along those lines about Shark Tank. Um, <laughs> you're, you're, i got to say, you're the first person who's ever asked me what players around the league think about Mark on Shark Tank. I mean, I hear from fans about it, and and, and a lot of fans are, feel good about it. Of course, there's always going to be a section of fans who don't like it and feel like it's distracting him from the team. But I have I have not heard one bit of feedback about Mark from players in the league vis-a-vis Shark Tank. Positive feedback about him as an owner, uh, nothing positive or negative about his television performance on Shark Tank. I don't know why. So I would assume... I would assume no news is good news, I guess. Yeah, just the way that he seems so in your face. And I happen to really like the guy, and I think he's a very bright mind. I could just see him demanding the team going over to his palatial estate when there's a new episode of Shark Tank and getting a big bowl of popcorn or something. That's just the vision I have in my head. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I hate to burst your bubble on this, Zach. I really do. But but to my knowledge, there's no uh, there's no weekly gatherings at the Cuban household where the team is mandated to come over and and give their review of his performance on Shark Tank. So there, there are team bonding activities. I don't think that that's made it into the rotation yet. Though. Very surprising. Mark Fowler, great stuff. Thank you. All right. Take care, Zach. All the best.